Hey there, welcome back to the Code Hub live coding sessions. Um, today we're going to cover variables again, uh, and we're hopefully going to move on to the next chapter in, in the Everyone Can Code Puzzles journey, which is all about conditional code, uh, which gets even more exciting, uh, as exciting as variables are. So first, what I want to say before we get started with our jumping into the playgrounds and jumping into the book is I want to point you at our YouTube channel. Um, I, the Twitch stream has all of our live content and is full of our mistakes and ums and ahs, as, you, as you've seen. Uh, what we do with our YouTube channel is I'll often post some, some extra stuff after the day is finished. Uh, we had some great comments yesterday about variables and, and really understanding them. Uh, so we actually threw together a quick build of the Learning Variables app with a new story baked in that's a really good example of how powerful variables really are, uh, where we have two variables, but they get substituted in lots of different places inside the story um, that hopefully brings the concept home really well to you. But we record that extra content and we'll post that in the YouTube kids.code playlist. So it's worth checking out. Um, especially if you feel like you're a little bit stuck. And if you want to go over any of my ums and ahs and these playgrounds sessions that we've been working through. Um, so with that, now we're going to jump into the, the back onto the iPad. We're going to play with another playground uh, to sort of enhance our knowledge for of variables uh, and, and see another couple instances where they become really useful. So let's go take a look. All right, so we're back on the iPad. Um, if you recall, if we open up books again, um, we had these suggested materials to go through when we're trying to learn about variables. We also went through our learning variables app. Today, we're gonna play around with spirals. I think we're ready for it. Now that we've, we've been through the ringer with a few of these playgrounds, I think we're just about ready for it. Before we do that though, I had a good question just before this session started about the answers playground. And so I have my, my playground here and I've set up a couple of questions that I wanna ask myself. So let's see, let's try starting that over again. So we're gonna pull up my answers playground Let's try one that's downloaded already. So while we're waiting for that, let's explain what the problem was. So the question was, I set up another variable. So I named my variable, but I called it something like name, right? Because that's what we have above. So that makes that that seems like a sensible thing to do. We'll change this to be name as well. So if I go to run this code, we're gonna see that we actually, we have problems, we can't run this code. So we have a, a couple red dots. So we have a message that says name previously declared here. And then we have another message saying, oops, we have an error, invalid redeclaration of name. So when you have variables inside your code, they need to be uniquely named. When we look at the learning variables app, this is why all the variables are called noun one, noun two, noun three, noun four, and so on, um, because they need to have their own unique names. We can't have two things called name one. If we, if we wanna put the value that we capture from this ask function into name, all we would do is we would say, actually, yeah, we wanna reuse that variable. We would just remove the var in front of it and everything will run fine. Now, what we'll see with this is if I type in my name the first time and I hit submit. Now, if we look, Swift Playgrounds has this really nice um, sort of variable view. You can look at a preview of the variable here. So what's being held in name right now is Matt. And in fact, we can see that when we print out, hi, Matt. Now, when we ask, do you love coding? the value of that is gonna get assigned to this name variable. So if I type in uh, yes, I'll hit submit. I can see that name 
there's my little preview again. If I tap on the ABC, it'll say yes. And when I print out show name plus I do love coding, it says yes, I do love coding. So now I've lost this value, Matt, because I've overwritten it with yes. So that's just a couple little nuances about variables that maybe we didn't quite cover yet yesterday. But it's a good, a great, great point to make. So if you have a new variable and you want to capture it, like we did yesterday, we would say var loves coding or var favorite animal um, or var favorite number if we wanted to capture that. All right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to go play around with that spirals uh, playground. So if you don't have it already, um, we're going to hit see all. Spirals is actually in the challenges section here. So right at the top of the Swift Playgrounds, we're going to go way to the end, and there are spirals. So we're going to draw some geometric curves. Now there's a lot of language from geometry uh, in this particular playground. Um, you can either immerse yourself in the ge ge geometric sorry, geometric language, or um, you can actually just appreciate the, the shapes. Either way, we'll get to get a feel for what variables can do. So I downloaded one already, so I'm gonna open up Spirals copy. It goes into a bit of explanation. This is a really great one to, to follow along with if you're doing roulettes in a math class. You can see it looks, looks kinda cool. We can pinch and zoom here on our live view. We can tap and it'll get rid of everything but the lines that are drawn. Tap again to bring them back. And let's see. So right now I have an error because I've I've been I was messing around with this. And let's see, we'll do that. And then we'll close this off. So if I run my code, I can draw a spiral. Now I can pass in different variables into this draw spiral function and it'll do different things. So in this case, it's drawing an epicyclide. If I tap just on the, the name here, I get some different autocompletes at the bottom. So let's try, let's cycle through all of them. Let's do the this one and we'll run my code. You can see where it's, it's changed the behavior of that draw spiral function just by using a different variable. Since variables, the root of variables is to, to vary things. It's things that are going to change. So you can cycle through all of these. And this is something that, that I encourage you to play around with. Uh, see what kind of cool shapes you can you can draw. It's a little bit like the spirograph you might have had um, when you were a kid or if you are still a kid. The spirograph you might have still. All right, so let's go to the next page. So what we're going to do is go tap on this arrow here. And it's gonna go into greater discussion about each one of these types of shapes. So the interesting part for us from a variables perspective is if we run this code, we can see our circle and our pen drawing this particular sp spiral. Now, if we wanna change this, these here, track radius is a variable that's been defined somewhere else. So there's a var track radius written somewhere in this code. And there's a var wheel radius written somewhere in this code. So I'm gonna change this though. And the track radius, I'll make it a bit smaller. And let's try running our code and see what happens, see what changes. Okay, so the track radius changed. This this thing down here changed. If I want to change the wheel radius, which is the larger orange wheel, um, maybe I can make that smaller as well. So maybe I'll make them a bit closer in size. Okay, so now I'm inside because the wheel radius is actually smaller than the track radius. So that's an example of what happens when I change my variables and how it gets reflected on the screen. If I really want to see the full power of um, Swift Playgrounds, I can go tap on this little bar here in the middle. And if I tap on it, two arrows show up. And if I tap on the one to the left, it'll bring this full screen.
And then to bring it back, there's the arrow over here to the way to the left, and I'll tap on that to bring back my coding view. So I'm going to tap on the next page. Now these are some of the other values that we can change. We can change colors. Now we did this a little bit in the Swift Turtle Graphics Playground. Um, if we tap on path color, let's make it a bit pink, and then the track color, we'll make that green. So if we run our code, okay, cool. Well, should we see that we've changed the two different things. Let's let's change this to, well, they're asking us, hey, why don't you change it to a, a decimal number uh, or what's called in Swift a double. Uh, and let's change it to uh, 10.2, like they're asking. So we would tap on this little number key there and do 10.2. Uh, and then, well, we'll leave the wheel radius as it is for now. So let's run my code. Okay, cool. Not bad. Now let's try changing this. So it says use a negative value here to draw the wheel on the outside of the track instead of the inside. If we change this to one instead of negative one, and we hit run my code. We'll see that now we're on the inside of the circle. If we move on to the next page, again, we can see that we can play around it with different variables. I think this is really interesting. This is what I love about the turtle graphics stuff is that you can kind of see the changes before you. Um, we could have used variables for a lot of our different distances that we were traveling with the, the, the little monkey turtle. Um, we could have used variables for our colors like, like we did here. It's now that you have this tool at your disposal, you can use it in any of the code that we've done so far. Uh, and there's even the thing that I like, especially about this uh, spirals playground is that they have a thing called playtime at the end where this is where you do, you can monkey around with loads of different things. So I change the light theme down here. If I change it back to false, change the draw speed to something a little bit less fast. Okay. That's, that's a bit more manageable. Change the background color, maybe a little bit lighter. Let's change the spoke length to six. So this is something that's that's kind of fun to share with your friends. You know, you're drawing something unique to yourself, especially given that you're going to come up with a different combination of variables than your your friend might, um, or your you can share it with your enemies if you like to. Um, it's something worth playing around with. I, I really like the spirals playground at the end of all that variables learning because it, it helps reinforce that, oh, okay, if I change this, it's actually affecting my code and what's getting drawn um, and what's happening. So between the answers playground where you can collect information from your friends and this spirals playground, uh, we actually go a long way with exploring all the different ways we can use variables. And that's variable. So between all of the, all the different tools we've played with, including the learning variables application. And if we go back, this is, if we go back, sorry, if we go back here to the, the books, um, you can see that kind of wraps up. We've done kind of everything in the, the variable section. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, move on to the next chapter. Conditional code. So now that we've started collecting stuff and we can tell the, the our code to remember things in variables, now we can start to get a lot more interesting with our code and we can start to branch out a little bit more. So we might, for example, around here, if we take a look out the window and we evaluate, all right, is it raining? If it's raining, I'm going to bring an umbrella with me. Um, if the sun is out, I'm, I'm going to leave it at home. That's, that's a condition, right? 
And in one case of the condition, if it's true, then I'm going to carry an umbrella with me. And if it's false, then I'm going to uh, leave it at home. We talked a little bit about Booleans when we looked at the switches that we toggled with Byte. And basically, they have two states, on or off. Uh, in our case, we've also, we will see that a Boolean, which is, is what we're talking about when we have something that's on or off, um, will have a value of either true or false when we're looking at it in code. And you can see here, so I gave an example that was pretty simple. If it's raining, do one thing. If it's not, do another. Um, you can actually get pretty complex with your your logic here for for conditionals. You can say, well, uh, you know, I'm going to evaluate one condition. If it's raining, great. I'll bring a uh, an umbrella. Maybe I also want to check to see if it's windy, because if it's windy, I don't think I want to bring an umbrella because it's just going to get broken. So we're going to start to implement a lot of this stuff in our code. So all of these things, the logic, implement, conditional code, we're going to start to, this is programming language that we use every day as professional programmers. You're going to use every day as a programmer starting out. Um, and let's, let's go, let's go dive in and, and see what playgrounds we have to play around with to take a look at conditionals. All right. So we're back to learn to code one. And there's a section called conditional code. So we're going to go through and look at the introduction now. So we're going to go back to Swift Playgrounds. Going to go back to our learn to code one. All right. So you can see we were in, we were deep in the for loops. Luckily, the next thing up is conditional code. So let's tap on the introduction there. This is how do you plan for the unexpected? All right. So maybe this isn't an app as applicable anymore, but this is a good, good case for conditionals. If we hit a traffic jam, we might want to take a different route to get to our destination. So this is a fairly handy example, you know, that, it, that you might use yourself. If, if the light's green, you can walk across the street. If it's red, we're going to wait. And now we're going to add to the syntax that we know already. So we've got for loop syntax. We've got function syntax. We've got syntax for writing and creating variables and assigning values to them. Now this is our conditional syntax. So to write, a condition, it kind of reads like the English language, you know, if this is our variable called light is green, we have our curly braces. And basically, if the light is green, if that's true, this code will get executed. Now, we also want to handle a case where maybe the opposite is true. So if the light is not green, it's going to go down to here and execute what's inside the else block. So anything that's inside these two braces, we're going to call a block of code because it's a whole section of code that we want to have execute together. So in this case, if we read through it, if the light is green, we see our brace. So we say, okay, great. Everything between this brace and the next closing one, is going to be code that will run if the light is green. And then when we see this else keyword, we'll say, okay, if, but if the light isn't green, if it's red or yellow or some other color, we're going to call this wait function. So let's see this in action. Okay, so now what we've done with these, these playgrounds is they've introduced a little bit of variability to the puzzle. Sometimes switches are going to be toggled on. Sometimes they're going to be toggled off. So if you look at the puzzle right now, we have the first one is off. The next one is on. And the next one is off. So we have a new variable called is on close switch that gets set when byte moves forward. 
Uh, and here in this example, we're saying if is on close switch, toggle the switch because we want to turn all these on, right? We have a little variable keeping track of our on switches here. And it's set to one right now because one of them is on. So let's go down here and tap to enter code. Now, if we try to solve this the way we've been solving it so far without any conditions, it's going to look like this. We're going to move forward once. Now, there's no switch there, so we're going to move forward again. That one's off right now, so I'll say toggle switch. We'll move forward. Now, we won't toggle that one because that one's on. So we'll move forward again. And then the last one is off, so we'll toggle the switch. So let's try to run this. All right, so Byte's going to move forward. And here we can see my switches got randomly reassigned. Oh, so we've just turned that one off. And we skipped that one, and we turned the last one on. So you can see that, so we might accidentally solve the problem. This code might have solved the problem if the switches had stayed in the same state that they were in when we first saw the puzzle. But we need to now start checking. Um, and when your code gets more advanced and it is starting to get input from other places, like your friend typing in an answer to their name or typing in whether or not they love coding, those are those are variables that we have to account for and make sure that we're we're coding around. So let's see. So every time we move forward now, we want to make sure that we check to see if we're on a closed switch. So let's use the if statement. So there's an if autocomplete down there. So let's tap on if we have a handy little autocomplete for our on close switch. So let's say if it's on a close switch, we want to toggle our switch. All right, so that's how we want to call toggle switch because we don't want to accidentally turn it off again. We can then move forward and we'll check again because we'll be on another switch. So we'll say if is on close switch, we'll tap down here, toggle switch. And then we'll move forward again. We'll say if is on close switch, toggle switch. The other thing I can do is if I tap on the braces, I can drag down and suck in that toggle switch there, just like we did with our for loops or our functions. So now if I run my code, let's see what happens. So byte gets reset back to the beginning. Our switches get reset to different states. We move forward, we move forward. Whoop, we're on a closed switch, so we toggled it. We're on another closed switch. And then we didn't run this code because the last one was on already. Now, let's try running that again and stepping through it. There we move forward. That's not very exciting. Here we move forward again. And then we check. We say, yep, we're running this code in here because we're on a closed switch. And you can see when we're not on a closed switch, we just sw skip to the bottom and we don't run this code. Now, you'll notice that we probably could have, if we used our previous lessons, we probably could have put this in a for loop and saved ourselves a lot of typing. But we can we can do that. We can tackle that in the next, the next one. So let's go on to the next page by tapping this button here. You can also see the definition of if statements if you tap on this thing here. Now we'll get into the else if in a sec. So let's tap on next page to go to the next page. Okay, so for this goal, now we want to use, we have an if statement where we'll run code if that statement is true. We can also, instead of just saying, hey, otherwise do this, this other thing, um, like in the case of the green light, hey, if it's green, do one thing, and then otherwise if it's any other color, wait. Um, we can now say something like this. Well, if is on a closed switch, toggle the switch. Otherwise, if we're on a gem, collect a gem. Now, this code is assuming that we're not gonna, there's not going to be a gem on top of a, a switch. 
So let's take a look. So we're going to move, like it says here, the instruction tell us move to the first randomized tile because these, these here are going to get randomized. So let's move forward. And now we're going to add an if statement. And then what we're going to do is say, okay, cool. If it's on a closed switch, we'll do what we did before. We'll toggle the switch. Now, the other thing I can do here with my if statement is I can tap on the brace. And these options will come up that are super handy. So we want an else if statement. So we want to test if we're on a, a gem. So let's tap on the add else if statement and say is on gem. Well, we want to collect the gem, right? So let's collect the gem. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to say move forward if is on close switch, we're going to toggle the switch. We're going to actually type it out this time. So we're going to tap at the end of this brace. And I'm going to bring up the keyboard down here. I'm going to hit a space. Else space if. And then I'm going to say is on gem. And then space. And then I need my curly braces, so I'm going to tap on the numbers key. Actually, scratch that. We'll do it the easy way. Well, here. Actually, we'll tap on this key then. And the braces are over here, so we'll tap on the opening one. And thankfully, it adds the closing one for us with the cursor in between the two. So now if I hit the return key, you can see I'm my code is indented. You don't have to have the code indented. I like the way this reads. You can kind of scan it easily and say, oh yeah, anything indented here will only get executed if I fall inside this brace. What do we do there? We'll collect the gem if we're on a gem. So let's try running this code. We're actually going to step through it again so we can see what's getting executed. And, and we're going to see the that little carrot on the side jump around a lot more because it has to evaluate these different conditions. So let's step through the code. All right, so we're going to move forward. All right, we toggled the switch because we're on a closed switch. Toggled the switch. Now there weren't any gems to collect. So let's try running this again and see if we can't get any, any gems there and see our, ourselves fall through into the collect gem branch. No luck that time either. All right, let's try it again. Come on, Byte. Give us a gem. Oh, nice. Well, you can see that we're at, we tested to see if we were on a gem, and then we collected the gem. And you can see here where the dots are left behind. This is the code that got run. So we moved forward. We tested to see if we were on a closed switch. We weren't. So we jumped over this code here down to this line. We tested to see if we were on a gem and then we were. So we ran inside, we fell inside this block and then we ran that code. Same thing happened here. Then we, we came outside of that block. We ran the next command, move forward. We tested to see if we're on a closed switch. We weren't. So we skipped this line down to the next brace and we said, okay, uh, if, are you on a gem? That was true. So we fell in here and we collected the gem. So let's go on to the next page. So we've done that very much by hand. Again, that was the same code written twice. And since we did learn about for loops, we probably want to make our lives a little bit easier, have to write a little bit less code. So if we look at this particular puzzle, this is going to be randomized, the stuff that's out here. We can't just say move forward, collect gem, move forward, toggle switch, move forward. We need to account for the fact that we might be on a gem, we might be on a switch, we might be on nothing. But we can assume that we're just going to be moving forward because we're going to get to the end here, go through the portal and back to the beginning and down to the end. So let's see, we're going to do it one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. So it's a good guess that that's going to be the number of times that we we're going to loop through our code. So if we run this code, we'll see that just like before in our for loops lessons, we're just going to keep moving forward 12 times. The gems moved out of our way. I think Byte's looking a little bit worried because he passed all those gems by. You can see our variables for our gem counter and our toggled switch counter aren't going up. Okay, not bad. Our hint gave us a little wave. So let's take a look at the hint. Okay, so we need to place a, an if statement under the move forward command. So let's try that. Let's go down here and tap on the if autocomplete. So let's test and see if we're on a closed switch. Or actually, and this, let's switch our logic around. Let's test and see if we're on a gem first. I want to make sure we collect the gems first. So collect the gem if we're on a gem. Now the next thing we want to look at is we want to add a... If we add an else statement, we could say, okay, well, if I'm not on gem, I must be on a switch. Let me toggle the switch. Let's try running that and see what happens. Okay. All right, I toggled the switch because I wasn't on a gem. Toggle the switch because I wasn't on a gem. Ooh, toggle the switch because I wasn't on a gem, but I actually wanted to leave that one on. Same with that one. All right, out I come. I'm going to try to toggle the switch anyway. Collected a gem. Okay, that code's behaving right. Okay, I toggled the switch. Okay, because I wasn't on a gem, I toggled the switch. And you can see I even jumped on the portal here where there's nothing for me to collect at all. So that's a little bug in my code. And in fact, the hint is telling me that there's a bug in my code. So see, I've got a, it tells me here that I need to add an else if block to check for a second condition. Okay, so let's go back here and let's change this to an else if statement. So I'm going to tap down here and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap and hold until I can drag up here on the other side of my brace. If you can't get there and you have to delete things, you have to delete things, no big deal. You can say, all right, let's add an else if statement. We'll make the condition is on a closed switch. Now we'll toggle the switch only if we're on a closed switch. And then do you know what? We'll get rid of this code here. Now we can leave this like this. It's not going to harm anybody because what's going to happen if we're not on a gem and we're not on a closed switch, it's going to execute the code inside this else block but I don't have any code inside this else block, so nothing's gonna happen. So let's try running it just to see. Okay, oh, it determined I'm on a closed switch. Cool, toggled the switch. Nice, so on this switch back here, it said, oh, I'm not on a gem or on a closed switch, so I went through here and ran no code. Same with the portal. Oh, nice. We've got seven of seven switches toggled. Two more gems to collect. Nice. Okay, we did it. Now, this might not be the prettiest. We could get rid of the code that we don't need. This is the same thing as what we just ran. But it's just to show you that you can write this a number of different ways. Um, and there's no one pure right way. Or maybe there is one pure right way, but look, as long as the code does the job, um, I think we're, we're winning here. So we're gonna hit next page and go on to the next puzzle. So this goes into our, our kind of Boolean conversation a little bit more. Um, if we go over here and tap on Boolean, it'll explain what a Boolean is. It's either a value of true or false. Just like we saw with the, the switches, they're either closed or open, on or off. 
what we're going to do is we're going to solve this puzzle and then I'd love to see you guys play around with conditionals um, like this, especially in the puzzles. We'll get into more complex conditionals probably a little bit tomorrow. Um, but this is worth working through the rest of the puzzles here for your, for, your, um, for today. If you're bored and you've got nothing else to do for the rest of the day, defining smarter functions, boxed in and decision tree are all really good puzzles to go through. I'd love to see your solutions for them, so feel free to post them to me. Um, but here, let's work through this one really quick. So we've got 16. It's already done the math for us. It's, we've got 16 steps to go through. We want to make sure that when we collect a gem, it looks like we're always making sure that we turn left. Right? So let's see. So if, let's see, if we want to test to see if we're on a gem, what are we going to do when we're on a gem? First, we'll collect it, most importantly. And then what we'll do is we'll turn left. And then otherwise, we're going to move forward. So let's let's try this out with that simple simple addition there. Let's try it. Okay, off we go. We're moving forward. Ooh, we're on a gem. So we collected it. We turned left. We tested to see if we were on a gem on the next run of the loop. And we so we move forward because we weren't anymore because we collected the gem. All right, we're moving forward because we're not on a gem. And there we go to the last one. Nice. Not too bad. So you can see that a pretty complex looking puzzle is actually relatively easy to solve. And by that, I mean, we haven't written a lot of code. Um, we've let Swift do a lot of the work for us with this for loop and this condition. We can say, okay, it's, well, every time, even though it may not be exactly the same, this puzzle, every single square, we can use the one loop with just a small conditional check in between. This is a really powerful programming concept. Um, I think it's it's huge, especially when you're starting to deal with um, user's input, like your friends typing in their names. Um, you can start to greet them. Maybe if there's someone that you're besties with, you can greet them especially special. I, I don't know, you can do, you, there's loads of things you can do with conditions and um, I'd love to see some of the stuff you come up with. So if you do have time for homework today, I would love to see some solutions for defining smarter functions boxed in in the de decision tree. You'll be way ahead of the game uh, for tomorrow because we'll con cover conditionals a bit more. And uh, we'll see you then.